Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ANCP accreditation webinar. I'm Vicky at EFIS Learning Team. Before we start, can I please have someone to type into the chat area to confirm the sound is coming through? Oh, good. Thanks for that. Um, just a tip for better sound quality, it will help if you close all the background applications, including the Outlook. I'll now quickly go through some housekeeping matters. Today's webinar will be recorded and uploaded to EFIS YouTube channel. Next week, I'll send everyone a follow-up email with a link to the video as well as a copy of the slides. As the webinar goes, please feel free to type your questions in the chat area. Our speakers may address your questions as they go or at the end of the presentation. And at the end of the webinar, please stay and complete a quick survey. Without further ado, I'll now hand over to our speakers, Sarah and Belinda. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Thank you, Vicky, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. As uh, Vicky mentioned, my name is Sarah Drees, and I am a member of the ANCP accreditation team. I work alongside Rebecca Lysart, who is the accreditation manager. And today I have joining me Belinda Lucas who is one of our independent accreditation assessors. And Belinda will join a little later on in the presentation to go through the criteria and also some suggestions for preparing for accreditation. So please, if at any stage you can't hear me or if I'm unclear, just type a message into the comment section and ask any questions along the way. Okay. Let's get started. So today, this presentation will cover just a general overview of accreditation, the eligibility requirements of accreditation, the step-by-step -step process, the key principles of accreditation. Belinda will look at the criteria A through to E and also, as I said, suggestions for preparing for accreditation. So we have tried to aim this presentation at both new applicants and also returning applicants. So hopefully you will all get something out of today's presentation. So I'm sure, whoops, gone too far. I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with the ANCP, but for those of you that aren't, the ANCP is DFAT's largest and longest running NGO program. It's been running for over 40 years. And the aim of the program is to support the development activities of accredited Australian accredited NGOs. In 2018-19, the ANCP was allocated a budget of $132.5 million, and we currently have 57 NGOs in the program operating in 59 countries. The ANCP is, highly regarded, is a highly regarded program both within DFAT and with the Minister. So in order to participate in the ANCP, NGOs must be accredited. The purpose of accreditation is to provide DFAT and the Australian public with confidence that we are funding well-managed and effective organisations accountable to their stakeholders. The accreditation process requires NGOs to undergo a thorough and independent assessment of their governance and risk management, development approaches and management, approaches to partnerships and collaboration, communications and financial management. And Belinda will go through those a little closer later on in the presentation. Accreditation is valid for five years and NGOs must maintain their accreditation status to continue to receive funds under the ANCP. And they must also continue to deliver projects funded under the ANCP in line with the standards assessed as part of accreditation. There are two levels of accreditation NGOs can apply for. These are base and full. Those applying for full will be required to respond to additional indicators. And there is also a funding difference. Um, so base level will give the NGO an annual grant of 150000 per year. And full is a minimum of 300000 plus a proportion of the remaining ANCP funds based on something we call RDE, which is Recognised Development Expenditure. And RDE is basically funds raised in Australia by the Australian public and spent overseas on development activities. 
So there is a range of rules as, what, as to what constitutes RDE and all the information on this is available on the ANCP um, webpage at the DFAT website. And I also understand there was recently a webinar on this topic, so that should now be available on ACFED's YouTube channel. So each year there is a three month window in which NGOs can apply for um, funding and that this year that window will be from the 1st of July to the 30th of September. For new organisations applying, DFAT will assess your application in the order that it is received, meaning if you submit an application on the 2nd of July then it's likely your application will go through first. For NGOs undergoing reaccreditation um, in 2019-20, you can submit any time online in accordance with the pre-agreed deadline. So for those re-accrediting NGOs, DFAT will generally write to you up to 12 months before your application is due for submission, advising you of the date, due date in Mardi Grants. All applications must now be submitted online through Smarty Grants. The links you can see on your page now can be found on the accreditation page of the DFAT website. And at the moment, there is just the link for the re-accrediting NGOs. However, from the 1st of July, you will also see a link there for new NGOs. And I'll just reiterate for re-accrediting NGOs to please make sure that you select the correct link. Otherwise, if you select the wrong link on the 30th of September, you will be locked out of your application and you will lose the information you have entered. And as always, if you experience any technical difficulties um, with Smarty Grants, you can contact the team, which is at smartygrants at dfat.gov.au and they can provide any assistance. Now DFAT does offer technical assistance to NGOs to help prepare for accreditation. In order to be eligible for technical assistance, you must, must either be a non-accredited NGO seeking accreditation or a base accredited NGO with an RDE of equal to or less than 150,000 and equivalent to equal to or less than five full-time staff and you must also be within 12 months of your re-accreditation due date. If approved, up to five days of technical assistance in accordance with DFAT's advisor remuneration framework will be reimbursed. So in order to apply for technical assistance, um, you need to send us an email at accreditation.gov.au and all the information on technical assistance can be found on page 12 of the accreditation manual. So on your screen now, you will see a rough overview of the process and timeframes. Accreditation can be a long and complex process for both NGO and DFAT, so there is a number of steps we need to go through. The first stage obviously is submitting your application, or as we call it, your agency profile online through Smarty Grants. Once that's been submitted, DFAT will then review that application to ensure it is eligible and has been completed correctly before sending it on to a review team. Now DFAT contracts an independent review team to undertake the accreditation reviews and the team consists of two development specialists and a finance, financial assessor. The review team will then complete a desk assessment which can take up to four weeks. At that stage, the NGO will then receive the desk assessment report, which outlines initial views of where the NGO is against each criteria and also details where more evidence is required. The NGO will then be given four to six weeks to prepare, to prepare for their on-site organisation review. During the on-site review, the team and also a DFAT observer will attend, spend two to three days at the NGO's head office to review the additional evidence and also to have discussions with key staff and the board. Following the OR, the review team will make a recommendation to DFAT as to whether the organisation should be accredited or not accredited. And they'll provide their findings in an organisational review report 
which DFAT will then review before sending on the onto the NGO for a right of reply. And at this point is your opportunity to correct any factual errors and also note any differences of opinion. That report is then sent through to the Committee for Development Cooperation. The CDC is a joint DFAT and NGO advisory body and one of its tasks is to review all of the accreditation for DFAT. The CDC is currently comprised of four NGO representatives and four DFAT representatives. And the CDC will then either choose to support or not support the review team's recommendations before the review report is sent to the DFAT delegate, which at this stage is the first assistant secretary of the humanitarian NGOs and partnerships division. So it might look like a quick process on the screen, but this actually can take up to six to nine months depending on when the CDCs are held. I'll now run you through some of the key principles that underpin the accreditation criteria, accreditation process, sorry. The first is uh, accountability and transparency. So the NGOs are assessed against an agreed set of criteria. This criteria has been agreed on by the CDC and internally through DFAT. Risk management. Accreditation is DFAT's front end risk management process and it's where DFAT is assured of an NGO's capacity to implement quality development programs and we're therefore confident to fund the NGO from the ANCP. I should also note that accreditation for DFAT is equivalent to DFAT's due diligence assessment. So NGOs who are successful in obtaining accreditation also meet these standards and other programs will use um, within DFAT will use this process. Peer assess it's a peer assessment process. The review team members that DFAT contracts are all experienced NGO and development professionals who have all been working in the Australian NGO sector for many years and have all held jobs within NGOs. The CDC, which oversees the accreditation process, has elected NGO representatives, all of whom, all of whom have a strong voice on the committee. And all of this is important to ensure the quality and consistency of the review process. Collaboration and participation. The review team will work with the NGO to understand their individual approaches. All NGOs approach their work slightly differently and the review team will work with you to try to understand how you meet the accreditation criteria. The assessments is evidence-based. The review team will assess the NGO through the review of documented evidence and discussions. They're not just looking that you have a policy, but they're, all look, all, they're also looking at how that policy is implemented and evidence of that implementation. Acknowledgement of the diversity of the Australian NGO sector. The expectations of performance against the accreditation criteria and indicators can, can accommodate the diversity within the sector. We're not just looking at a one approach for, all, for the whole sector. Continuous learning and quality capacity improvement in the sector. The process of preparing for accreditation supports NGOs to reflect on current practice and strengthens it. And we'll often get feedback following the process from NGOs acknowledging how useful the process was. And finally, accreditation is reflective of good practice. The accreditation criteria is periodically reviewed to continue to reflect sector good practice and we aim to keep up with the change, changes within the sector. So that's just a quick overview of the process of accreditation. I'm, I'll now hand over to Belinda who will run you through the criteria and also some tips for preparing for accreditation. Thanks Sarah and hello everybody. If you've got any questions from that first part of the presentation, um, please feel free to drop us a note in the comments box and Sarah can look at those while I'm preparing or presenting this part of the presentation. Um, so as you know, um, Sarah's already outlined, um, there are five areas or categories of criteria. Um, in total we have 15 criteria and each of these have clear indicators. Um, it's really important um, for organisations to understand that 
it's a requirement that all criteria must be met. Um, and for each of the criteria, there are base indicators as well as additional indicators for organisations applying for full level accreditation. A really helpful place for organisations to start and refer to is the Accreditation Guidance Manual, which Sarah referred to in her presentation. And that's available on the um, accreditation portal, if you like, on the DFAT website. And this manual outlines really detailed guidance on every um, criteria that's used in accreditation, um, with a full list of the indicators that apply for base and full level, and also a list of all of the documentation that will be reviewed at the desk assessment and also at the organisational um, review on site. So as I said, there's five areas of practice which are on that screen before you. We call these sections A, B, C, D and E. So section A um, is an area of practice that relates to governance and risk management. Uh, section B relates to development approaches and management. That's essentially how you approach um, overseas development and the way that you manage your programs. Section C relates to approaches to partnership and collaboration. This really refers to who you define as your partners and the way that you engage with partners overseas. Section D uh, is a section of relates to communication, which really refers to the way that you profile the work of your organisation and acknowledge support from the Australian Government through the ANCP. And Section E relates to financial management. And as I said, across those five areas of practice, there's 15 criteria. Um, while all of them must be met, um, there is one criterion within them, which is A3 which relates to child safeguarding. This is referred to as a red line criterion. We'll go into this a bit more on the next slide. Um, but that's a very important criterion because if an organisation fails any aspect of that criterion, it fails accreditation outright. Whereas the remaining 14 criteria, while they must be passed, there's room for organisations to present um, all areas of practice in those criteria. Um, and it's possible for an accreditation to meet uh, an organisation to meet those criteria with a subject too, and we'll talk about that more in the next part of the presentation. So, first we look at criterion A, which relates to governance and risk management. As you can see on your screen, there's three criterion: A1, A2, and A3. And I won't speak to each of those criterion in detail. Um, but I will give you an overview of the category of criteria for each of them. This really seeks to understand that the organisation has um, a governing body that fulfils all of its um, governing body duties and responsibilities. It's really important that an organisation can demonstrate that the organisation fulfils its governance duties through the holding of regular board meetings, it holds an annual general meeting, and it discharges its responsibilities to provide oversight on risk management and ensure accountability for the organisation. So the types of documentation that will be provided and reviewed against this criterion are usually minutes of board meetings, minutes of subcommittee meetings, and your general meetings. Um, and through the organisation review, a discussion with board representatives. Uh, A2 is a criterion that looks at overall organisational risk. Um, so this is looking at the systems, policies and frameworks that an organisation has internally to both identify, mitigate and respond to risk issues and to report risk. Um, it also looks at um, particular aspects of risk relating to staff safety, security and high risk environments. A3, as I said, is the criterion in um, the whole accreditation framework, which is our red line criterion. It relates to child safeguarding and it's, there's a requirement that all organisations that um, meet accreditation criteria fulfil all nine minimum standards of DFAT's child protection policy, which is available on the DFAT website. Um, the nine minimum standards are clearly outlined in that policy and in applying for accreditation, an organisation needs to submit a self-assessment against the nine minimum standards and provide evidence that it fully complies with all nine standards. If anyone has any questions about that, um, please feel free to pop your comment in the message box. 
Criterion B um, is related to development approaches and management. And you can see in this category that there's four criterion, B1, 2, 3 and 4. And this really tracks um, the organisation's um, policies and approaches through the project management cycle. So in B1, we look to know that an organisation has a track record. So we're not looking for organisations who are new to development applying for accreditation. We're looking for at least a two year track record in demonstrating that the organisation has fully designed, implemented, managed and reported on development activity overseas. Section B2 um, looks at organisations' capacity to deliver good quality programs. And here we really look at the project management cycle. So we're looking to know that organisations um, have a process and policy that allows them to design programs well against development principles and criteria. That the organisation has an ability to appraise any proposal against good quality uh, development standards or principles. But the organisation has a monitoring process in place whereby it um, both collects data from its overseas partners and projects to determine whether progress is proceeding as planned and is delivering quality. Um, and overall project management um, capacity to show that it has an ability to influence and make changes to a project at all stages through the project cycle. B3 relates to cross-cutting themes and by cross-cutting themes we refer to um, good practice relating to gender, disability, the environment, safeguarding, any area that really cuts across um, core development effectiveness principles. So here we look for organisations to show that they have policies that guide their work in those cross-cutting areas and also that their systems prompt an organisation to um, respond to those criteria or those cross-cutting areas from the stage of design right through implementation, risk management and review. Um, so criterion B4 relates to monitoring and evaluation. So here we look for an organisation's systems again to identify what change that they seek to achieve through a project. So in other words, what objectives the organisation has, what indicators it's established for its project and how it intends to and does collect information to determine um, project success. Um, we also look for organisations to show evidence that they've invested in evaluating and learning from their projects to ensure that future projects um, reflect best practice. So as we said, um, criterion um, this area of criteria relates um, to four areas of criterion and within the criterion specifically there are indicators for base level and full level um, organisations. We've got a question from Zoe, but Zoe I'm going to come back to that at the end so just bear with me until I get through the criteria. So we move on now to section C which is approaches to partnership and collaboration. As you can see here, there's three criterion. The first criterion relates to a requirement for organisations to have documented agreements with their partner organisations overseas. This is usually in the form of memorandums of understanding or contracts, or grant agreements or project agreements. It's an opportunity for organisations to demonstrate that the responsibilities and obligations of each party are clearly outlined in an agreement and that the obligations that an organisation has to DFAT are passed on to its partners overseas to ensure that those obligations are executed um, comprehensively. C2 um, is a requirement for organisations to demonstrate that they understand their partners. So it relates to due diligence and also capacity. And there's two aspects to this criterion. Undertaking due diligence refers to the assurances an Australian NGO puts in place to know that the entity that it's going to deal with overseas um, is one of integrity, that it has registration in whatever way is required, um, that it has the required policies and processes um, in that organisation to execute its contractual obligations to the Australian NGO, um, and, uh, and to have a confidence that it's an organisation that will discharge funds in a way that's accountable and appropriate. 
So lots of organisations use due diligence assessments or due diligence tools to um, give it that confidence or certainty. But we also expect that organisations understand the capacity of their organisations, which is, a, is an extension beyond due diligence. So it's really important, I think as Sarah said earlier, that organisations that work with DFAT um, represent diversity. So DFAT knows that many of the contexts um, that Australian organisations work in are complex and the partners that it works with are of different capacities. And there's um, plenty of room within ANCP to work with high capacity and medium and low capacity partners. But what this criteria asks is the Australian organisation clearly understands the capacity of its partner um, so that where there's gaps in capacity, the project or initiative is tailored to accommodate those gaps and that the Australian NGO responds to those gaps with appropriate strategies to mitigate any risks that lower capacity partners might present. This flows into C3 quite nicely, which looks for evidence that the Australian NGO continues to provide support to its partners to implement projects in a way that delivers good quality effective work. So we're looking for evidence that it provides training to partners where appropriate or provides capacity building support through mentoring, um, training, regular field visits, monitoring, um, sharing of resources and tools. Um, so it looks to know that the organisation, beyond establishing a contractual arrangement or agreement, um, continues to work closely with the partner to support the partner to deliver good quality development programming. Criterion D relates to communications. And as I said earlier, this um, comprises of two parts. The first part is really important to DFAT, and that is uh, um, comprises of two parts. The first part is really important to DFAT, and that is that the Australian NGO can show evidence that it acknowledges and attributes Australian government support. Um, this is really important because it shows that the Australian NGO is working with its Australian constituency and its partners overseas to identify its funding sources from the Australian government. Um, which continues to build an understanding in the Australian public and other partners overseas of the um, support the Australian government has for development initiatives. Criterion D2 um, also looks at communications with um, the Australian public um, and other stakeholders. It seeks to ensure that whatever communication an organisation provides about itself is accurate and honest. Um, that it's accessible to the public and that it respects the dignity of recipient communities. So this criteria looks to know that when information is shared about recipient communities, that consent is provided from those communities, that consent is appropriate um, and complies with child protection guidelines um, and promotes the dignity um, and lived experience of communities in a way that they would agree with. So that's Criterion D. We move on now to Criterion E, which relates to financial management. And this looks at um, internal controls and support for partners around financial management. So the first one really tests the systems and the policies of the Australian NGO in Australia and looks at the systems it has in place to transfer funds, account for funds and equip funds um, with its partners overseas. E2 looks at the organisation's approach to working and supporting their partners around financial management capacity. So this again, similar to due diligence capacity assessment under Criterion C, um, tries to build an understanding of the Australian Energy's approach to understanding the financial capacity of its partners and then providing the degree of monitoring that is appropriate to that understanding. So obviously where Financial management capacity is lower, we'd expect to see a higher level of investment from the Australian NGO in monitoring and support for the financial capacity of that organisation. Um, and it's all with the intent, of course, to ensure that activity is undertaken in a way that's professionally competent and accountable financially for the funds that are provided um, by, the, by the Australian government. Um, and finally, E3 um, is the criteria that seeks to ensure that the Australian NGO has policy systems and practices to ma manage financial risk. So within E1, E2 and E3, obviously we're looking to ensure that there's 
systems to test um, and ensure accountability relating to financial management. Um, so we're looking at um, issues of fraud um, and also systems and practices to, in, to, to ensure that there's no um, support for terrorism financing. Um, what's really important in this criterion is that the organisation understands that we're testing Australian NGO systems, but also the extent to which the Australian organisation monitors funds through their implementing partners, particularly in respect to financial accountability, fraud and counterterrorism. So this is a very quick overview of the 15 criteria. Um, and if anyone has any questions on any particular aspect of this criterion, then please share them. Um, but as I said, the best resource to give you detail on this um, is the accreditation manual that provides guidance on the criteria and then outlines the indicators for base and full and lists the documentation that's required for each of the criterion. I'm just going to go now to Zoe's question, which I think most of you can see. It asks about the new DFAT PSEA policy and the anti-terrorism policy and ask whether those will impact on the criteria and also where they might update the criteria. Zoe, I can say from a very broad perspective that the two areas of PSEA and, and counterterrorism are already integrated into the criteria. So around um, the prevention of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, is picked up under Section A2, which relates to um, um, issues around staff integrity. And if you look at A.2.3, it requires that the Australian NGO has a safeguarding policy and practices in place to manage those risks relating to sexual exploitation, abuse, harassment and misconduct. Um, and A.2.4 also um, requires the organisation to have a public facing complaints handling, whistleblowing and incident management system. Both of those criteria um, tie in quite nicely with DFAT's new PSEA policy, so it will already be tested in that way. Um, and at this stage there's no additional requirement and um, Sarah might be able to speak to whether that's likely going forward. Um, in terms of the anti-terrorism policy, it's a little bit early to tell how if that will impact the criteria. It's still out, um, the discussion paper is still under review. So yeah, at this stage it's a little bit um, too early to tell how that will affect the criteria. Um, but currently, counterterrorism is addressed quite comprehensively in E2 and E3. Um, so the organisation is still required to have um, terrorism financing policy and outline its policies, practices and systems to mitigate the risk of, of counterterrorism or terrorism financing. Um, so there's no more questions just now on the criterion, but if there are, please include them in the comments box. I might just move on to a section now relating to preparing for accreditation. I think Sarah alluded to this before, um, accreditation is not um, not a not a straight not a light process. Um, as you can see, the 15 criteria cut across a full organisation's work, areas of work. Um, so what we see is that it's typical for organisations to spend at least a year and often longer preparing for accreditation. While we ask for a two-year track record of programming, we also look for a track record of policies and systems being implemented. Um, so organisations really need to have a confidence um, going into accreditation that those policies are well established, that their systems are already in, in practice and that they've got plenty of evidence to demonstrate that. Um, so organisations really do spend quite a long time prior to actually submitting an application to prepare for accreditation. Um, and that's probably really important for any organisation that's new or applying for the first time to appreciate. Um, this picks up on the comment I just made. It's obviously really important that policies, guidelines and templates have really been in place for a reasonable period before applying for accreditation. Sometimes what we see for organisations applying for accreditation, either new or established, 
Is it in preparing for accreditation they identify gaps in their systems or improvements that they want to make? So they develop new templates or new policies just prior to accreditation. And that makes it very difficult during an accreditation to demonstrate that the organisation um, has embedded those systems or policies or templates into their work, um, which is really important for an accreditation team to observe during accreditation. So we could only encourage you to give yourselves maximum time to develop policies or templates well in advance of your intention to apply for accreditation. As Sarah already mentioned, um, it's a systems and evidence-based process, so there really is a very strong focus on documented evidence. This means that in addition to discussion or claims of good work, an organisation really needs to show documented systems and worked examples through documentation to really demonstrate that they meet accreditation criteria. So we look for evidence of completed templates, completed evaluations, completed proposals and appraisals and monitoring trips um, during accreditation. Um, and this is why the track record um, is so important that organisations need to, need to have this, these evidence built up over a really reasonable period of time prior to accreditation to demonstrate that they have the documented evidence on the day. Uh, it's really important that the organisation understands that an accreditation assesses the whole organisation. As you can see from the criteria, um, we look at evidence from you know, board minutes through to partnership documents, communications materials, financial management and programs material. So the danger that some organisations um, sometimes face is that accreditation is assigned to just the programs unit in an organisation whereas the documentation we look at cuts across the whole organisation. So it's best when an organisation from the beginning really understands it as a whole of organisation assessment, which often means engaging different members from different parts of the organisation to come together and almost form an accreditation committee or working group so that the organisation takes responsibility for preparation in all departments. We find that it's really helpful for organisations to learn from the experience of others when preparing for accreditation, um, particularly those organisations who are new. Um, it's excellent if you can identify another organisation that's prepared to share their experience with you, maybe even to share some of their own policies or templates or their experience in how they prepared for accreditation. Um, this gives an organisation pretty deep insights as to what an accreditation team will be looking for how much resourcing is really required to prepare for accreditation and the type of attention that's needed across the organisation um, to make a successful application. Um, and ACFID can play a really important role in that, in being able to link organisations together um, who have been through the accreditation process recently or who are of a similar size or nature um, to make the preparation experience most relevant to the applicant. Um, another great tip is that lots of organisations find it really helpful to undertake a mock assessment before the, the actual organisation review. This is an opportunity um, to get staff feeling comfortable with the process. Um, it's similar to undertaking a self-assessment against the accreditation criteria. Um, sometimes organisations do this internally by appointing someone in the organisation to um, put aside two or three days and um, asking teams to prepare and present their work as they would in an organisation review. Um, other organisations um, sometimes will call on um, someone from a, a peer organisation to undertake that mock accreditation um, or sometimes organisations will engage a consultant which can be used um, within the technical assistance application from DFAT um, if you meet the eligibility criteria. So I think um, they're all the kind of key tips um, for preparing. Um, I think as Sarah said earlier, um, it is a two-stage process. So the first stage is obviously preparing for um, the desk assessment, which is the online application. Um, but the second stage um, is an organisation preparing documentation for the actual organisation review. 
which is when the accreditation team comes in for three days, two to three days um, with the organisation. Um, so preparing for the application online is often um, desk-based and resource intensive, um, but it can be helpful then to um, do something like a mock assessment between the two, the two aspects of the review to make sure that all staff across the organisation are feeling ready for a team arriving in their organisation. So that draws um, my section of the presentation to an end. Um, if any of you are new to the experience and have questions, please share them. Um, and if others have been through the process um, and have a clarifying question that they want to ask, please share those too. Um, we'll have a few more minutes in the presentation if you want to include them and I'll pass back to Sarah now to wrap up the presentation. Thanks, Belinda. Yep, thanks everyone for joining us today. As Belinda said, if you've got any questions you would like to ask, ask either myself or Belinda, just pop it into the comment section now. But as always, if you have any concerns or comments or questions, just email the accreditation at dfat.gov.au and we are more than happy to help. And if you are a new organisation looking at applying, please get in contact with us early and um, we're always happy to meet with you and provide any advice along the way. Okay. Yeah, doesn't look... Okay. Is someone typing? No, okay. Okay, if there's no more questions, then we might wrap up. But as I mentioned, yep, if you've anything from today's discussion, if you want to clarify, please email accreditation at dfat.gov.au. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Belinda, for the presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar. Now, please stay and complete a quick survey. See you next time. <laughs>